Hi, I'm Nick from the City of St. Louis Department of Health, and today we will be discussing temporary food permits as well as proper food safety procedures. In this video, we will cover the temporary food permits offered by the Department of Health, hygiene protocols, equipment, and safe food handling. At the Department of Health, we offer seven temporary food permits. The following flowchart will help you decide which one is right for you. If you know which food permit you need, feel free to skip ahead to section 2. Otherwise, we'll work through this flowchart step by step, starting from the top. To begin, will you be selling food for a profit? If not, are you giving away food as a charitable donation? If yes, then you may qualify for the charitable feeding permit. If you are selling food for a profit, do you live in and will you be selling in a low income, low access, or LILA census tract? Please consult the map on screen or in the link below the video to determine if your census tract is in the LILA area. If you live in a LILA area, is the food you are intending to sell nutritious? For a definition of nutritious foods, as well as a list of examples, follow the link below the video. If you are selling food in a LILA area, you reside in a LILA area, and the food you are selling is nutritious, you may qualify for the LILA Community Food Permit. If you are not in a LILA census tract, or you are not selling nutritious foods, your permit may be determined by the type of food you produce. If you are producing cottage foods, which could include baked goods, jams or jellies made from home, as outlined in the requirements in the link below, you may qualify for the Cottage Food Production Permit Waiver. If you are producing low-risk foods, which are limited to popcorn, lemonade, and shaved ice or snow cones, you may qualify for the Specialty Food Permit. If you are producing foods that are neither low-risk nor cottage foods, your permit will be determined by the location you sell at. If you are selling at a farmer's market as either an organizer or vendor, you may qualify for the farmer's market food permit. If you are not selling at a farmer's market, but are selling an event with five or more vendors, you may qualify for a sponsored food permit as an organizer or vendor. Finally, if you are not selling an event with at least five vendors, you may qualify for the traditional food permit. If you have any questions about food permit requirements and qualifications, or if you are still unsure which temporary food permit is right for you, please consult the resources linked below the video or contact the Department of Health and we'll be happy to assist you. Having a properly set up hand washing station is a crucial component of maintaining personal hygiene. All hand wash stations are required to have clean potable water, hand soap, disposable towels, a catch pan for wastewater, and a waste basket. If you do not have access to an established hand washing station, you can assemble one similar to the diagram on the screen. In order to thoroughly wash your hands, begin by setting the tap to a temperature just hot enough to still be comfortable. Start by wetting your hands with water, then lather with soap. Ensure you are washing up to your wrists and under your fingernails. Scrub your hands with soap for at least 20 seconds. Try singing the happy birthday song twice in your head to approximate the time. After your hands and wrists have been lathered with soap, rinse them thoroughly under the water. Finally, dry your hands with a clean paper towel and use the paper towel to turn off the faucet. Always wash your hands before starting or returning to work, after eating, smoking or using the restroom, when changing activities, before putting on gloves and whenever your hands become soiled. Remember that the use of gloves or hand sanitizers is not a substitute for hand washing. In order to maintain personal hygiene, all food handlers must be in good health, with no infections, no open cuts or illnesses, smoking and eating is prohibited in areas where food is prepared or served, or where utensils or equipment are cleaned. Clean clothing and proper hair coverings, including beard restraints, must be worn in food preparation areas at all times. Finally. Pets and unauthorized persons, non-food handlers, are not permitted in food preparation areas. When handling ready-to-eat foods, employees must always either wear clean gloves or use clean serving instruments such as tongs or spatulas and should frequently switch gloves. To ensure gloves are not sources of cross-contamination, they must be changed before beginning a new task, 
if they become contaminated when soiled or torn after four hours or less of continuous wear, after handling raw meat, and before handling cooked ready-to-eat food. In order to protect yourself and your patrons from environmental hazards, several pieces of equipment are required at every food establishment or event. These include a shelter must be provided over the food preparation area, waste receptacles must be available, all food and paper products must be stored six inches off the ground, and lastly there must be enough clean water to last for the duration of the event. This water can be provided by the site or brought in with other equipment. In addition to having the proper pieces of equipment, they must also be properly utilized and maintained to be safe and effective. All food storage containers must be clean, in good repair, and made of food grade materials. Utensils and food containers for customer use must be disposable and stored to prevent contamination. A metal stem thermometer with a temperature range of 0 degrees Fahrenheit to 220 degrees Fahrenheit and increments no greater than 2 degrees Fahrenheit must be on hand to monitor cooking and holding temperatures. When using a thermometer to take temperatures of food, make sure it is washed, rinsed, sanitized, and air dried before coming in contact with food. When using the thermometer, stick it into the thickest part of the food and always take two readings in different spots to get an accurate temperature. All cooking and serving equipment, including pots, pans, utensils, and cutting boards, must be thoroughly cleaned by a five-step process. For this, you will need either a three-compartment sink or three large tubs. If using a sink, it must be designated for equipment washing only. As seen in the graphic, the first compartment or tub will contain clean, warm water with dish soap or detergent. The second compartment should contain clean water that is at least 110 degrees Fahrenheit. The final compartment will contain either room temperature water with a sanitizing solution such as bleach mixed to the appropriate concentration as indicated on the bottle, or clean water at at least 171 degrees Fahrenheit. To begin, scrape off any chunks of food into a trash can, then move the ware to the first sink. Scrub the ware under the soapy water until clean, and replace the water when either the suds are gone or the water is dirty. Then transfer the ware to the second compartment. Rinse the ware either through scrubbing or via the use of a sprayer until all remaining food particles are gone. Replace the rinse water if it becomes dirty or sudsy, or if the temperature falls below 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Next, transfer the ware to the third compartment and allow it to sit submerged for at least 45 seconds. Replace a third compartment solution when it becomes cloudy or if the temperature or concentration fall below requirements. Finally, transfer the wear to a clean rack to air dry. Never use a towel to dry off wares as this may introduce contaminants. A big mistake that can be made when cooking and serving food is time temperature abuse. This occurs when food stays at improper temperatures for too long, allowing pathogens to grow. The temperatures at which pathogens can grow best is between 41 and 135 degrees Fahrenheit, otherwise known as the danger zone, because it is at these temperatures where food becomes unsafe. Hot foods must be kept above 135 degrees Fahrenheit, and cold foods must be kept below 41 degrees Fahrenheit at all times. Special precautions must be taken when sourcing and storing food at an event or establishment. Firstly, all foods must either be made on-site or come from an approved source that undergoes regular inspection, such as a restaurant, grocery store, or bakery. Food must be adequately refrigerated at their respective temperatures to prevent time and temperature abuse. Finally, ice that has been used to cool drinks or food items cannot be used in drinks. We hope you found this training video informative. If you have any questions, please feel free to review the slides in the video and the resources linked below, or contact the Department of Health via the contact information on screen. Thank you for taking the time to learn how you can protect yourselves and others, and good luck in all your food service endeavors.